All right, to close the event, Chris Wiggins from the New York Times. Uh, thanks very much for being here. You're actually a returning um, speaker. Uh, but at, least, at least once, yes. Yeah, but l l last time you were a uh, professor at Columbia and am. a computational biologist. Uh, and now you're coming back as the head of data science at the New York Times. Yeah, so same thing. What happened? Uh, so, <laughs> okay, it's, it's the same thing. So the, what happened was I finally took a sabbatical. So uh, I'd been putting off taking a sabbatical for a long time. And then um, in spring of 2013, I decided I was going to take a sabbatical. So I cast a really wide net. And I was talking to Google and Facebook and startups and uh, SEC and lots of other things that I was thinking about. And it was, it was Find the other one out. Google, Sorry? Find the odd one out, Google, Facebook, Well, SEC. the odd one out, and in some ways the odd one out was the New York Times. And then I asked a lot of people who I knew who have done interesting things with their careers uh, for advice. And one of the people I talked to was Mark Hansen, who some of you may know. He's a professor in the journalism school at Columbia, although his PhD was in like high mathematical stats from Berkeley. Um, and, but he did the lobby art for the New York Times. So the next time you go to the New York Times, go look in the lobby. He wrote the Python that makes that lobby art go. It's pretty cool. Uh, so he knew everybody there. And he and made some introductions and said, instead of going to do a sabbatical at some researchy place where you would basically be doing the same thing you'd be doing anyway, go to the New York Times. It would be really weird. Uh, and, it, and, it has, and it's been really weird. Uh, it's been really, I couldn't have anticipated the kind of things we've been doing there. So but that, that, that does bring up uh, this really interesting question, which is one of the topics that's been debated a few times here in this event, which is this um, uh, the, the importance of uh, sort of horizontal uh, technical and scientific knowledge around data science, for lack of a better term, versus vertical expertise. Uh, so the fact that you're coming from a different field to do something like this in the vertical field of journalism seems to indicate that you can easily translate scientific skills into, uh, into uh, a vertical type job. Yes, and. So I would say, I mean, what I say to young people is go get a degree, or not, not that you have to get a PhD, but go study one thing really hard and do a really good job at it so you at least know what it's like to, to see a solved problem. And so that you know what it's like to spend a couple of years making mistakes because the way that you really know, know a field is you fool yourself into understanding the field for a couple of years and then then you have a deeper level of confusion. Uh, so <laughs> I, I do think it's a good idea to go study one thing really hard, really long and, and make a lot of mistakes in it. But also you're pointing to something that I think is really, uh, if you look at the history of applied computational statistics, as we would now call it machine learning, I think there's a long under-discussed in academia thread of the importance of working in complementary teams. And, and Hannah brought this up in, the, in one context, which I, I haven't had the pleasure of, 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 of collaborating with real honest social, sci social scientists yet. I look forward to that. But um, if you look at the history of, of the people who framed the, the intellectual foundation on which data science now sits, and that includes people, people like Leo Bryman and, and John Tukey, you know, these are people who were high fluting mathematical stati statisticians and then went out and did dirty, dirty consulting. Right? So Tukey spent all this time working for ETS, Educational Testing Services, as, as among other people. Bryman had a proper tenured position as a mathematical probabilist, wrote a beautiful book on mathematical probability at UCLA, and then just walked out and just like walked the earth in Santa Monica taking these crazy consulting gigs. And then he like gave us cart and like which begat, you know, he gave us random forests. I mean, like, all these beautiful, uh, very applied ideas in data science came from interacting with real messy problems in the type of collaboration that Hannah's talking about, right? And the thing that makes data science different from machine learning is not just getting epsilon better predictive accuracy on learning, you know, cat's faces from pictures. It's this thing where you interact with somebody from a different discipline. And this somebody from a different discipline has, like, a hundred years of domain expertise. They don't necessarily speak calculus. They, they have an understanding of how some system works. And then they've been challenged by abundant data. And then you as a data scientist are working with them to try to reframe their questions as machine learning tasks, interpret your machine learning tasks in such a way that speaks to their language. And that's the part that I would say is totally the same. So like the, the task of working in computational biology, if you really do work with biologists, which I always try to do, was a lot like the experience that I have at the New York Times working now with people in marketing, product, or strategy. 
in that they have like clear understanding of the system, things that I have very little intuition for, like marketing. Like I, I, I had never really had to think about marketing before working with the New York Times. It's, it's complicated. Uh, but they have a domain expertise, and then they have this abundant data, and you're working with them to try to figure out how to use these data to answer their questions. It's actually very similar to things that I saw working in computational biology, including setting a very high bar for when you're not fooling yourself, uh, not being tempted to find the answer that you think should be there, which happens a lot in computational social sciences. As Hannah pointed out from Duncan Watts's book, Everything is Obvious, there's all sorts of ways that you think, well, I understand how people act, so they're going to do this thing. But you, you don't really know if they're going to do this thing until you've done the experiment. And, and, and do you find a little bit to this point about uh, being able to work with other people, uh, do you find that the, or did you find that the people in the New York Times Maybe not the top people that made the decision, but the people that you actually need to work with on a daily basis. Did you find that they were ready to embrace a, a data-driven approach culturally? Um, there was heterogeneity in sort of data philia and data phobia. Uh, I would also say that the Times is an organization in amazing transition right now because of the transition that journalism is going through, at, not as a craft, but as a business. Um, so it's difficult to answer that question because it, it was, it, it's very different depending on to whom you speak in the organization. And I would have made no predictions about who would be dataphilic and dataphobic. I mean, there were some, there's some, there's some people who I work with who are you know, old timers at the New York Times, meaning they've been there for like 20 years, uh, who were very pro-data and are very pro-data science. Um, so it, it, it's sort of been embraced differently at all levels, but also, I like to use Steve Blank's definition of a startup, that a startup is a, is a temporary organization in search of a scalable and repeatable business model. And in that sense, every publisher is now a startup because the business model of publishing just completely evaporated 2004 through 2008. Like print advertising spend in the United States lost about 50% of its value in like four years, 2008 to 2012. Uh, and so, and, that, and you've seen, you know, Chicago Tribune sold, Washington Post sold, Boston Globe bought by the New York Times and then sold. Like, there's been just tremendous change in newspapers as a, as a business. So, the point of that with respect to data is, people at the New York Times are actually very open to considering how they might understand their customers better through data, how they might understand their readers better through data, and. Uh, it's, it's widely recognized that they, well, first of all, they have a website, and every company that has a website or any sort of digital interaction with your customers, that opens up the possibility of, of, of understanding your readers at, at scale, like at web scale, in the same way that you would do a focus group. Uh, and so that's, that's part of what we're trying to unlock. And so to this point, so tell us, I guess, in some detail what you do there, and I, I assume there's two broad categories, or at least two, two questions. One, which is um, you know, building a closer relationship with their readership and, and all the thing. Uh, but presumably, there's a part around sort of newsroom analytics, content analytics. And so let, let, let's, let's start with maybe with the, um, the, the, the part around using data to help create a uh, stronger and more longer lasting relationship with readers. Yeah, that's definitely an overriding um, interest. Uh, in terms of my, uh, the things that I've, I've worked on, it, it, it really echoes something else John Tukey said, which is that one of the greatest parts about being a statistician is that you get to play in everybody else's playground. And, and we've really done that. Uh, so between, people think about newspapers as being, as a business, as being church and state, where church is the journalist and state is everything else. So I like to think about the New York Times or any technology company now as church, state, and engineering. And I'm in the engineering layer, which is, a, 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 you know, we're a technology function, which means we're, we're empowering both the, the church side and the state side. So we've worked on problems involving advertising, marketing, product, newsroom analytics, print distribution. At this point, we've worked on problems throughout the organization. Um, at a high level, yes, the goal is to understand the readers better uh, and to you know, perfect the art and science of making sure that the good journalism gets to as many people as possible. Um, for more specifics on what we're doing, I urge you all to apply to come work with me because we're hiring like crazy in the data science group. And then I can get you all NDA'd up and tell you everything. It'll, it'll be great. In the, 
in the in the non NDA territory. Uh, so I, I, I guess you know a, a core aspect of this is predictive analytics, right? Like, have, 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 have you have you found any kind of uh, I don't know weird correlation that yes. that <laughs> it's it's super cool. A, a, anything you could uh, disclose, or is that? Uh, um. So, as Duncan's book says, everything is obvious once you know the answer. Uh, there, are, there are ways in which we've found particular ways that people use the site that are correlated with loyalty uh, and ways that other people use the site that are correlated with at risk. Uh, I will say that we focus, I focus on predictive analytics. I, in general, I find working on, on supervised learning or predictive models to be reassuring because I know if I'm wrong. Whereas, you know, models where I'm clustering, I sort of never know at the end of the day, should I have clustered things a different way? So we focus on models that are predictive, but also try to build models that are interpretable. So we wish to learn what are the covariates that correlate with uh, return engagement or that correlate with loyalty um, and which covariates correlate with churn. Um, Meaning that you let the data tell the story as opposed to you trying to start with a hypothesis and verifying the hypothesis with the data? Um, a few years ago I would have said that, that w that's what we do is we let the data speak and reveal unto us what are the really interesting covariates except for two things that I think temper my, um, temper the extent to which it's that pure. One is, you know, there's a lot of computa amateur computational social science that goes into figuring out how are you going to represent a person. You know, maybe you should represent the person by uh, how many times they visited or how many times they went to these different web pages or maybe a feature that represents that they've been to the website more recently than they used to or they haven't been, you know, maybe they average every once a week, they come back or something like that. Maybe you've got their zip code and that itself is a join key on an abundance of data about that zip codes or something like that. But you, you do a lot of feature engineering in general in predictive analytics. So. I would say that there's a limit. I mean, I try to let the data speak for itself, and I try to do things that generally are in 100 or 1,000 dimensional things. So like I'll have 100 or 1,000 covariates that could be interesting, and then use the appropriate machine learning to reveal uh, a small, interpretable, predictive model. That said, you know, we, we only, you can't discover a covariate that you didn't put in. So that's one way in which I would now say that you know, I'm not really being pure about letting the data decide. The other thing is, I don't know if you've ever seen, if you've seen these videos of the DeepMind people who go and learn how to play video games just using the raw pixel values as features, but like clearly there are ways that you could just let, I mean, there the pixels really are speaking for themselves, so I feel, I feel a little uh, like there are other people out there who are, who are really doing no feature engineering and yet getting predictive models. Not interpretable models. They, they have no idea how the hell these deep networks are, are playing brick out or something like that, um, but they are predictive. Um, so to the to the newsroom analytics part, so I, yeah. I, I, I think it's probably a reasonably safe assumption that the New York Times probably, in terms of editorial and content, doesn't work like BuzzFeed um, or, or Upworthy. Uh, but what would see? And and I'm saying this actually not so joking. I think I think I think BuzzFeed basically created a completely different type of journalism and turned it into a, a business. Okay, Have you. <laughs> By all means, <laughs> let us know what you think. Uh, but to which extent is that heresy at the at the New York Times, and to which extent is there some level of openness to that? Um, this is actually very well documented. So, the New York Times, as a newsroom, is very good at research, and actually, I think they're very strong at the craft of journalism in part because they're very self-critical. So. I urge you, I urge you, I urge you to go check out the innovation report which was written by a group of about eight journalists with an intended audience of two other journalists, namely they wrote it for, um, for Dean and Jill, the, who were then the leadership of the newsroom. Of course it was leaked to BuzzFeed and uh, is now is available on the interweb for all of us. And you got the tes 10 most shocking moments in the, in the report. <laughs> I actually, so one, one thing is about the report is that it wasn't written in a, it, it wasn't in a way to be digested by hum, for humans, it was written for Jill and Dean, so there's no table of contents, so I actually went and wrote a table of contents for it and put it on GitHub, so, uh, so there is sort of a list of the t 10 most interesting things. I, actually, there's a couple of stats on the, on the I put it on a, a gist of like the number of times that data was mentioned and stuff like that. Um, but you will read in that innovation report that people at the New York Times are certainly aware of BuzzFeed Upworthy uh, and the changing nature of journalism and the changing nature of the way that audiences are themselves digesting information. 
um, all of which accelerated by, by technology, right? Each of us is holding a ridiculously powerful supercomputer in our pockets all the time, for which we look at cats, but you know, we, we have uh, continually changing ways of relating to information. Uh, and that's, that's really changing the, the news business. Again, not the craft of journalism, but the news business. Um, so read the innovation report and you'll see that, that people in the New York Times are actually very forward thinking about the existence of BuzzFeed, the existence of uh, Upworthy, what the value of journalism is in that process and what the value is of, let's, let's say, audience development. Trying to develop an audience and trying to promote your content in such a way that the the journalism you produce is, is getting to its natural audience, um, to, to as many people as possible as you, 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 you think about when you're writing that story. Speaking of mobile, anything cool sort of data related with NYT now in terms of, I don't know, leveraging location data or sensor data or like anything cool to the, produce content in a contextually relevant way? There's a, a the, the mobile group is also very forward looking and so I'm working closely with the mobile group to think about um, uh, how to leverage data uh, in different ways. I'm a big fan of NYT Now. If you haven't checked it out, NYT Now sort of gives you a, a bite-sized summary of a lot of news elements on the first tab. The second tab sort of gives you things that New York Times reporters are reading from around the web. Um, and so it's a nice little uh, experience. And the graphics group at, at New York Times is fantastic and, and continues, in my opinion, to be the world leader in data graphics, data journalism, including on mobile. There was a really cool thing yesterday about um, people climbing the side of a mountain in Yosemite. And if you view it on mobile, you sort of scroll through the story. And in the background, the mountain sort of rotates around, gives you this 3D view of how they were going up. It was so anyways, they continue to innovate on how um, technology allows a, a change in storytelling. Like, so because we are ingesting information differently, it opens up the possibility of storytelling in a different way. So um, in addition to all the ways that people there are open to possible possibilities of having a data science team, which we're growing, we're hiring, uh, which we're growing to, to try to understand our audience better, in the newsroom side, they're also very open to the craft of audience analytics, and in fact, they have a whole very rapidly growing audience development team, um, and also just to innovative ways of storytelling. Cool. Uh, last question from me, and then I'll open it up to people. Um, tell us about the data engineering uh, part of this, um, including the, the infrastructure and what you guys use to do all of this. Yeah, so that's another reason why Mark Hansen encouraged me to go to the New York Times, is because the data engineering side <laughs> Had, um, or the data engineering group had just completed building a, a, a whole bespoke tracking system to record every event. So um, my particular group uses mostly open source tools. We use a lot of Python and scikit-learn. I use a little bit of R, um, although less and less all the time, moving towards Python. Uh, we use a lot of IPython notebooks for, for sort of sharing things among each other when we're fleshing out an idea. And then at some point when it becomes production, it becomes Elastic MapReduce, proper MapReduce in Java. There's a lot of use of um, both S3 and HDFS, so we do a lot of MapReduce do jobs to chomp up huge JSON buckets of our own design in S3 via EC2 in order to render it down to a bite-sized data table so we can beat it down with scikit-learn. That's sort of the tech stack. You know, all the open source was uh, was deployed uh, in house. I mean, not using any kind of vendor or. Uh... Um, no, I, well, a lot of the, so a lot of the so. There's a lot of data tables coming from heterogeneous sources. So we have a lot of PII that is sort of Oracle style vendor things, and it's safe. And then there's web logs, which are less about PII, and that's put on S3. Um, there's a lot of vendors in terms of ingesting information and. Uh, querying data and uh, you know the sort of industrial scale equivalent of running a cron job that's done using with the support of vendor uh, tools. So there's a pretty healthy balance between uh, open source tools and vendor tools. Actually, the one of the people who who sort of is in charge of data architecture just arrived from um, Amazon, and he's well literate in all of AWS and Dynamo for that matter. So we, we have a pretty, I mean, in terms of build or buy, if, if, we, if there's something out there we could buy, we'll buy it. And if there's an open source alternative, then we'll definitely use that because most of the group know open source. It's 
well documented. Certainly our machine learning work leverages heavily um, open source tools. Great, thanks. Questions? Elliot Noma, Garrett Asset Management. Uh, you've talked in terms of uh, several concepts, church and state. You've talked in terms of getting, using social media or new media, changes in the audience, changes in the industry as a whole. One of the recent blow-ups has been the takeover and subsequent uh, evisceration of the New Republic. And in terms of what happened to the, the editorial staff there, the policies, the controversies within there. Um, are there any lessons from that in terms of how you operate? The types of questions you ask, what uh, information you need, how, they're inter how the, the information is taken within the organization to avoid this sort of situation? Yeah, TNR is a great story, as is um, Pierre Omidar's venture, right? So that was another blow up, I guess less well documented than the TNR blow up. And they're both just totally about um, people, right? In terms of like people process and technology, or if you like people ideas and things in that order, those are both like total people failures, right? Which as you know, many, like many startups failed not for any like product market fit, hoo-ha, but just because of people problems. And so there, I'd say what you have is you have a craft, you have the craft of journalism, and like any craft, you have like a guild that has perfected that craft for centuries and has its own mores. You know, I, I come from academia, which is also a, a guild system. Um, and then you have people who just did not get that at all. And they probably could have found ways to work together in such a way that they found common values and worked together, but both in the case of, of Pierre Madar's um, startup where um, things just totally fell apart. And, well, I mean, it's still running, so it, it didn't completely fall apart. And the New Republic, there was some clear real culture clashes, in part out of, you know, I can say this because I'm on, this, on, this, on the state side, a, a lack of respect for the workings of the people in the guild, right? Like, those people, they have a set of values that you should respect. So, for example, at the New York Times, there are strong values of news judgment. And, news, and, and the people who speak about news judgment and, and guide, make, use it as the guide in their decisions are the people in the newsroom, right? And I think that's, I, I guess that speaks in part to what a data scientist should do, which is to be a really good listener, right? Because you really cannot go into a biologist or a social scientist or a bunch of journalists and say, I am going to deep learning your craft and, and you need to stop what you're doing and replace it with convolutional whatever. I mean, you really need to be a good listener and understand what their values are and then figure out the extent to which your skills may be useful in advancing those values. And sometimes they're not. So um, I, I, would, I would say the two lessons are, one, it, it, it just reaffirms the fact that many young businesses fail because of people things rather than anything else. And I think it speaks to the fact that there actually is a craft there. And you, this is one of the things that I think many venture capitalists are now realizing now that they're investing as con in content companies, is maybe content is a thing. Like maybe software can eat everything up to the point where you actually need some people who actually create some content in there. Uh, and that's an interesting thing to see in the last two years as even Andreessen himself is investing in, in content creating companies. Um, but, so I would say it, 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 the lessons are, one, that the data scientists should be good listeners, and another is that you know, a lot of companies blow up because of people things rather than because of market things or technology things. All right, last question. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for coming out and speaking. Um, I'm finishing up my undergraduate degree this year, realizing how much I didn't learn. Um, and um, I feel like everyone wants to be more data-driven. I certainly do. Uh, but I'm realizing there's so many things I didn't learn in terms of uh, technical abilities. So as a culture, how do we become more data-driven when we don't all necessarily have the skills yet to do so? Um, so there's, so the glib answer, which everyone will give you, is learn to code. Um, so there's sort of two answers I will give you. One is, oh, there's so many coding resources out there. You could just become a technological person. And you can certainly see many blogs that will tell you that. Um, so you know, I do believe that people can do what they set their minds to. Like, 
it's been a, a one lesson for me as I got older is that you actually can teach old dogs new trick. You can you can like teach anybody a new trick if they really want to learn that trick. So I mean, if you really have your heart set out to become a technologist and become functionally literate in data science, there are it's it's, it's much easier now than it was ten years ago to become functionally literate as a data scientist. The other lesson, and this I think speaks to some of the things Hannah Wallach was saying, is that. Um, one of the lessons I learned from my colleague Mark Hansen was the idea of multiliteracies. So multiliteracies was a sort of a catchword in computational science 10 years ago. Well, it wasn't in computational science. It was actually like in English professors writing about computational science. And after about a decade of everybody saying, oh, we all have to make all of our students compu computationally literate, people started thinking, what the hell does this word literate mean? How do you know when you're literate? Uh, and so you can find this literature from about 10 years ago about people pointing out that there are really multiliteracies because we're asking some students to be functionally literate, to be able to code. We're asking some people to be rhetorically literate, that is, to be able to understand what it means to interact with a computer and to be able to use computers to tell a story, which is a rhetorical power. And also to be critically literate, which although you don't find this in, in academic literature, they're basically saying, can you call bullshit on things? Like, do you have enough, like critical literacy should be the ability to have somebody say, oh, I used machine learning to make the New York Times today and all of the reporters have been put to sleep. You know, and you'd be like, no, that, that I really don't believe you. Right? So um, one thing that I think we all can you know, sort of raise the bar in our understanding of data literacies is to say, perhaps having a data literate society doesn't mean that everybody learns to code and that everybody knows scikit-learn, but rather that people excel in these multiliteracies. So, and, and again, part of being a data scientist is not just the functional literacy, right? It's also the rhetorical literacy, how to use this graph to tell a story, and the critical literacy so that when you think, hmm, maybe I can, it's like, I, I was, somebody interviewed me and they said, oh, well, can you tell people sexual orientation from their clicks? And I was like, no, I can't do that. I have no training data on that at all. No, I cannot do that. So the ability to just know the limits of what's possible with data, I think that critical literacy, I think is another, um, is another one of like three primary literacies we can encourage everybody to have. So, I mean, I think we can have a data literate society with multi-literacies without having literacy simply mean you write code. But, you know, how to take that code and give it life in the form of rhetorical literacy, how not to be taken advantage of because somebody else has authority just because you can't figure out what they're talking about so you believe them, that's bad, um, right? And, it, and it's happening every day with data. So. Uh, critical literacy, rhetorical literacy, and functional literacy, I think, are all equally important parts of having a data literate society. On that note, thank you, Chris. <laughs>